Muy buenas tardes. Hoy jueves 9 de junio les damos la cordial bienvenida al ciclo virtual Investigación y Programas en Salud Mental de Niños, Adolescentes y Jóvenes dentro de las Jornadas Institucionales 2022 por el 40 aniversario del Instituto Nacional de Salud Mental Honorio Delgado y de Yonoguchi. Vamos a iniciar con un importantísimo tema, prevención del abuso de sustancias en adolescentes, conectando el cerebro y el comportamiento. La ponencia estará a cargo del doctor Jason Barrow Sánchez, quien es doctor en consejería psicológica por la Universidad de Oregon, magíster en psicología por la Universidad del Pacífico en Stockton, California investigador y profesor del Departamento de Psicología Educacional de la Universidad de Utah. Sus áreas de investigación incluyen la prevención y el tratamiento del abuso de sustancias en poblaciones de adolescentes con interés particular en adolescentes latinos. Damos la cordial bienvenida al doctor Jason Barrow y a, a su traductor Daniel Torres. Muy buenas tardes. Adelante, doctor. Gracias. So let me well, welcome everybody. Um, I, I believe you can see my screen. My name is Jason Bro Sanchez. I'm a professor in counseling psychology at the University of Utah. I've been here for 20 years. Um, I'm originally from Southern California um, in, in the United States, and uh, I'm happy to be with you today. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Juan, and thank you others for inviting me today. I'm going to share a little bit about what I do in terms of the prevention of substance use in, in adolescents. Um, I'm presenting this today on behalf of a center that I run here at the University of Utah. It's called the Mountain Plains Prevention Technology Transfer Center. We cover six states in the US, um, North, South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana, Utah, and Colorado. And um, since we are federally funded through our government, I just have to put this uh, disclaimer here that anything you hear is my opinion and not the opinion of our government, so forth. But the other benefit to you is that we have a website and, and there's our website link at the top. Please feel free to use our website. We have a lot of free material on there, um, past webinars, past presentations and so forth. Um, I, I will say that most of it is, is, it, is in English. Um, but if you can translate the materials, um, you know, you're welcome to use them and so forth. But please check it out because we have a lot of good information about prevention and substance use and so forth. Um, the other thing that I will say is if, if as I'm going through the presentation, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to, um, to ask. I, I'll be honest with you, I have a hard time uh, monitoring the chat at the same time I'm presenting. So I'm not necessarily looking at the chat, but, but you can just let me know. Um, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Okay, so we're gonna get started. And, and I also wanna say that the material that I'm gonna present is mostly from the, from the United States. And so you'll have to make some comparisons about what this may look like in, in Peru and, and so forth. But one of the questions that, that I'm commonly asked as a psychologist is what are the most commonly used substances by adolescents in the US? And it turns out the most commonly used substances are cannabis, alcohol and e-cigarettes. And we have surveys in the US that happen every year and they happen um, across grades, primarily eighth, 10th and 12th grades in schools. And we get our estimates based on those. And so at any one time, what we find is that in the past 30 days, we have about 30%, anywhere from 20% to 30% using one of these three substances. Okay, so those are averages across those grade or across, this is a particular 12th grade, across 12th grade. And the other thing I want to point out is if we look at grades in general, um, hang on a second, let me revise this. If we look at specific grades across 8th, 10th, and 12th, we see that there tends to be a trend from when youth are younger to when they get older, there's a higher correlation with using substances. Um, so it means that as youth grow older, they have more opportunity to use a particular substance. It doesn't mean they will, but there's, it's a higher likelihood that they may. And within the US, the three more, again, the three primary use substances in terms of frequency are cannabis, alcohol, and e-cigarettes. 
Um, it used to be uh, cigarettes, used to, combustible cigarettes used to be one of the most used substances, but that changed probably about eight years ago or so. And it's only been recently within the past five years that our, that our surveys have actually been measuring e-cigarette use. Um, it also turns out that I like to give you what are call, I call them factoids or information pieces. And it also turns out that the earlier adolescents start using or youth start using a particular, particular substance and the, and the first substance they're likely to pick up is it used to be combustible cigarettes, but now it's e-cigarettes the higher likelihood that they're going to use a substance later on and when they become adults. So unfortunately, the earlier they start using a particular substance is a good predictor later on for continuing use of various substances. Okay. But what I really want to point out based on the graphs that I just showed you is that if we take that information and put it into what I call kind of the prevention triangle, we can look at it a different way. So, so these are data for 12th grade, and I combined cannabis, alcohol, and e-cigarettes, so the three most commonly used substances. And this is for, for 12th graders uh, in the US uh, in 2020. And what this is suggesting is that about 70 or 80% are not using a particular any of those substances, but it turns out that about 20 to 30% are. So one of the things to consider here is that most adolescents actually do not report, at least in the US, do not report using a substance in the past 30 days, but there's, there's, a, different, there's a smaller proportion, about 20 to 30%, depending on what the substance is, who do report using it. So from a prevention standpoint, what I like to point out is that what are the things that keep kids or keep youth in the green part of the triangle versus what are the things that puts them in the yellow part of the triangle? So if we can prevent things from occurring in the first place, we can do a lot more good than waiting for something to occur at a treatment phase and then trying to treatment. We, could, we, could, we can consider this from an economical perspective. Treatment is more cost. Uh, it's more expensive than prevention is. And in the US, we spend more money on treatment than we do prevention. Um, but it turns out that the more opportunity we put in prevention, the better opportunity do we have actually for savings, not only in financial savings, but emotional savings. Because why wait until a youth develops a substance use disorder when we can prevent it in the first place? So my talk today is really gonna be about what are the things that keep some kids or the majority of kids, at least in the US, in the green part of the triangle? And what, it, what are the reasons why some kids end up in the yellow part of the triangle? And also what are the things that we can help to support kids to stay in the green part of the triangle. And if they do end up in the yellow part, what are things that we can do to support them to get to the green part of the triangle? So that's kind of the basis of my talk today. I'm gonna to talk about it in two different ways. One is kind of from a, a social and behavioral aspect and then one's from a biological aspect, which is more of the brain development stuff. Okay, so moving forward, what are some of the key things that keep kids in the different parts of the triangle? realizing that the majority of youth don't report using substances in the past 30 days. So one of the models, and, and many of you may be familiar with this one, is called a risk and protective factor model. So the idea is that there are certain things that increase the risk and certain things that decrease the risk. So a risk factor is anything that, anything that increases the risk of using a particular substance or any other problem behavior, like anything that increases the risk of not finishing school or having fights with others and so forth. It's not exclusive to substances, although we're gonna be talking about it in relation to substances today. The other side of that is to think about what are the protective factors or what are the things that help mitigate against or buffer against using a particular substance? And those are what are called protective factors, okay? So those are things that decrease the risk. So if we think about a risk, one particular risk, as an example, is the availability of substances. So it turns out in the literature base that the more available substances are, the more likely youth are to use them. So if we go from this red kind of ellipse here to this yellow box, the more likely or the more available substances are increases the opportunity that it's going to be used. However, one of the things we've shown in our own studies is that one of the protective factors is when youth perceive a particular substance to be harmful to themselves. So if they perceive by using e-cigarettes or using cannabis that that's not something they, don't, they, they wanna do, it actually buffers against the use of substances. So even though the risk may be there in terms of the availability of substances, 
If you have some protective factors that buffer against it or prevent it, the outcome actually decreases and it, and it actually increases the probability that they're not going to use a particular substance. Now, one of the questions I typically get is, do we know how many risk and protective factors? Is there, is there a mathematical formula or an algorithm we can use? We don't. All we know is that more risk factors are bad, <laughs> more protective factors are better, but, but there's no magical numbers between the number of risk factors we need or the number of protective factors. So I, I wanna go into just briefly talking about some of the risk and protective factors, some of which, which you may be already familiar with. So at the individual and peer level, early use of substances, the earlier our youth are that they start using substances is unfortunately a risk factor for later use of substances. Early and persistent problem behaviors, not only in substance use, but other things like fighting or not finishing school. Those are some of the things we, we measure in the US. Uh, favorable attitudes towards the use of substances, thinking that substances are okay, rebelliousness or not following rules or rule breaking. Also peer use of substances. So I, I, in the US, I do a lot of talks for schools and for parents. And one of the things parents ask me all the time is my, is my youth using, is my adolescent using a substance? And the first thing I say is, I don't know because I don't know your adolescent. But I can tell you from the correlational studies that one of the things I do know is if the youth is hanging around other peers who use substances, the likelihood increases by a high amount. Also, there's genetic, genetic susceptibility. So if there's some, somewhere in the family tree, the closer in the family tree that someone else may have a substance use problem, it, it increases a risk for the, use having, the youth having a substance use problem. It doesn't mean that it's gonna happen for sure, but it's just a higher risk factor. Family factors include things like family conflicts, when the family has conflict or problems with family management, parents think substances are okay, or a family history of substance use and so forth. Here's, here's some of the protective factors, however, some of the things that buffer against or, or decrease the risk of using substances. One is the social, social emotional, behavioral, cognitive, and moral competence. So that's a, that's a mouthful. What does that actually mean? It actually means when youth have better skill sets as in terms of problem solving and decision making, they make better decisions and they're less likely to use substances and engage in other problem behavior. And we're gonna talk about that more in terms of brain development in a minute. So also level of self-efficacy, if, if you're familiar with the concept of self-efficacy, the more adolescents have the belief that they can actually do things and achieve things, the less likely they are to turn to other behaviors that are gonna cause them trouble like substance use. The more they are great and have relationships to spirituality, it doesn't matter what religion, but some connection to spirituality it's like other organized things in which they have a connection and a feeling and a bonding. The more resiliency they have, learning from that we can all make mistakes and we all do, but we can learn from the mistakes and, it's, and the mistakes are not the end of the world. We, we can learn from them and do better the next time. Family, school, and, and community uh, protective factors include things like opportunities for pro-social involvement, have other outlets that are positive things. Some of the things in the US include sports or clubs or other things. Recognition for positive behavior so that, so that kids actually get recognized for doing positive things and not just recognized for doing bad behavior or what we consider problem behavior. Bonding, or it's a fancy way to say connection. And, and the three areas that we look for connection in is positive connection to one's family, one's school, and one's peer group. The more opportunity you have for positive bonding in one of those areas, the better the outcomes. And then finally, healthy beliefs and standards for behavior so that they know the differences between kind of healthy behaviors and unhealthy behaviors. So going back to one of the things I was saying before, when they perceive specific behaviors to be bad for them, they're actually less likely to do them, believe it or not. Okay, so those are some of the social and behavioral factors that we talk about in terms of risk and protective factors. Some of the things we don't talk about as much is adolescent brain development. And so one of the questions I typically get is why is brain development important? Well, it's important because it teaches us another way to look at how adolescents develop and what's developing across time in terms of the brain. So the other thing that we know from the neuroscience literature is in the past 25 years, the neuroscience literature has taught us a lot, a lot more about what we know about brain development. And it used to be 20 years ago, we thought that the brain stopped development at age, roughly age five. That's not the case. We know that the brain continues to develop. And when I do these, when I do these presentations in person, one of the questions I ask is one of the, what, are, what is one of the common things 
that we know about brain development. And usually someone responds, well, the brain doesn't fully develop until a person's mid twenties, right? On average. And so what does that mean? And we're gonna talk about that in a second. But the cool thing is here, the neat thing is, is that what neuroscience has done has taught us and, and put it in, in, in the public knowledge about some of the things we know about what happens around brain development. And so that can help teach us as interventionists, as psychologists, as counselors, as preventionists, whatever it may be, as teachers, how to work with adolescents, okay? So, so some quick things about the brain, it develops from, the, from the, the bottom to the top and it develops from the back to the front. The brain is also, um, it, it's, it's specialized, meaning different parts of the brain do different things, but it's also interconnected, me meaning that even different parts of the brain do different things, it communicates with each other. So we know that when one part of the brain gets damaged, it can communicate with the other part of the brain and help alleviate some of those things. Okay, that's kind of an extreme case. The other thing we know is that, is that when someone's born, right, uh, a baby's born, that the brain develop, the kind of the, the foundational aspects of the brain, there's about 80 to 100 billion neurons in the brain. And these neurons are these things that make basically make connections between the messages that occur in the brain. And what we talk about when the brain's developing is that the, the, the neurons are getting better formed in different ways. They're becoming longer, more sophisticated because of the learning that's taking place. And they're becoming better at communicating across the brain in terms of messaging. And so when we learn stuff, that's partly what's going on is your neurons are making better connections about learning about a specific behavior and so forth. So what's happening as the brain develops, and when we say as the brain's growing and developing, these neurons are making better connections across time, okay? Okay, so three major parts of the brain. So I keep it really simple. Um, this is a, a really simple, you know, biology area of the brain. I've taught these skill sets to, to, to young kids, like early as sixth grade, all the way to 12th graders. I've worked with a lot of adolescents and I've taught it a lot to adults. And really the, the goal here is just to keep it really simple. There's three parts of the brain. One's the brain stem, which is basically the bottom part of the brain, which helps keep us alive. It's all those things we don't wanna think about like uh, the autonomic system. So our respiration, um, so our breathing, so to speak, our heart rates, our digestion and so forth. The middle part of the brain, however, is the, what we call the limbic area. And there's at least three structures here, which are pretty important. One's called the amygdala, One's called the hippocampus, and one called, is called the hypothalamus, among, among others. These are the ones I'm going to focus on. And this is what we consider the emotional part of the brain. Well, the amygdala is what we consider that part of the brain that helps us determine a fight or flight response. So when we get startled about something, when we have to determine if this thing's a threat or not a threat, that's what's really kicking in is the amygdala. And those neurons are kicking in. And how those neurons communicate with each other is between the neurons, there's neurochemicals. And they're making these messages, neurochemicals are getting released, and the brain's communicating with each other. Well, it turns out that the hippocampus is also involved with that and forming new memories in that part of the brain and the hypothalamus, which is connected to hormones. And it also turns out in terms of what we know about adolescent brain development is that adolescence is a key time when this middle part of the brain is developing. Okay. However, when we say the brain doesn't fully develop into a person's mid twenties on average, what we're actually talking about is this top part of the brain or the cortex area of the brain. That's what's not fully developing. And again, what we mean by fully developing is not making those neural connections between the brain. We want to give it the capacity to do that. So let me give you a quick example. When we put our hand on a hot stove, what happens is the middle part of our brain kicks in. And our, and, our, and our amygdala kicks in and says, this is bad. I don't want my hand to be on a hot, hot stove. And it immediately kick, and we immediately take it off. And that's a good thing. That's a, biologically pre, that's a biological preset that we have pre-programmed into our brain because it keeps us from harming ourselves, basically from getting our hand burnt. What happens there is the amygdala kicks in as along with other substructures in the middle part of the brain. It sends out neurochemicals um, like cortisol, which is a stress response. It says, this is harmful, I don't wanna do this. What also cortisol does is it slows down the top part of your brain, which is the prefrontal cortex. 
So here's the benefit. When we put our hand on a hot stove, amygdala kicks in, says we don't want to do this, slows down the prefrontal cortex and says, I don't want to, I don't want the brain to be thinking about this for a long amount of time. Because if the brain does think about this for a long amount of time, we're going to burn ourselves. So it slows down the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is the area where we make our executive decisions, we do our problem solving, we do our decision making. We do, we do our, our consequence balance between should I wait for this or should I do this or and so on and so forth. So it's a biological system that kicks into place. It turns out though, however, that substances, when we use substances, it mimics that response. And we're gonna talk about that more in, in, a, in a few different slides, in a few slides. So what I just pointed out to you is kind of the common way to think about adolescent brain development. Bottom part of the brain is, is pretty much developed Middle part of the brain is developing during adolescence. Top part of the brain is not fully developed during adolescence. Okay, that, that's kind of an average way to think about that. So if we take this slide here, that's kind of this blue line. That's on average kind of what happens. Well, it also turns out that there's great individual variability. So some adolescents will make better decisions than some adults. So let me, let me help you with this. So this, this graph here across the x-axis is, is age, so as you get older across the y-axis is accuracy in a cognitive test. So basically what it's saying here is a 15 year old sometimes, if you look at this dot right here, will make better decisions than a 25 year old. So what, what is the reason why? What, why is there some individual differences or individual variability in that? Well, it turns out that there could be some things that slow down the development of the brain or the capacity for learning in the brain, right? It could be through things like trauma, like chronic trauma, use of substances, or environment, right? When kids, when one of the things we know, you know, in the U.S. is when kids don't get read to at earlier ages, it actually slows down the process for them to pick up reading later on. And, and reading early on is a really a, a good predictor of later kind of academic outcomes. So we then we know that environment can play a role in that. So when, when youth don't have particular enrichment opportunities when they're younger, can affect them later on. We know that if we introduce things into the body, like particular substances, that can play a role. And we also know when kids experience things like chronic stress or trauma or abuse, that can play a role. So there's various things that can produce different outcomes. And that's what we're trying to tease apart and look at why is that the case. So, so given that I just told you that there's kind of an average way to think about brain development, and there's also great individual, individual variability in how this works. And we're gonna kind of look at some of the reasons why. But before we do that, I just wanted to point out, as we think about adolescence, there's some common things that adolescents go through. And one of them is called puberty, right? So puberty in the, in the US, uh, the common age for puberty, the average age for puberty right now is about age 12. About a hundred years ago, the average age for puberty was 17, so it was older. So just what I told you about adolescent brain development, if you think of that, about that in context, if we know that the brain doesn't fully develop until a person's mid-20s, think about how we treat puberty, at least, at least from my perspective, from in the US. In the US, um, puberty, you know, typically from an age, from a chron chronological age, typically happens right between 11 and 13, let's say. But when puberty hits, there's a social aspect of that that we, we treat youth differently. We know there's stuff going on with their body, but we also expect different behaviors. We expect more adult-like behaviors that they're gonna perform. So in, in, in some cultures, we celebrate that, right? Uh, at their age 13, we throw them a party, or at age 15, we throw them a party. And the expectation is the behavior changes. The reality is it doesn't match the biology always of what's going on in the brain. Okay, so I want to highlight that a little more by giving you some age-based markers of adolescent development in the U.S. In the U.S., we consider 13 as a teenager. Why? Because we make it up. It's not based on science. It's just made up something we make up. In most states in the, in the United States, at 16, you can get a driver's license. Why? Again, we made that up. That's kind of a legislative piece, but it's not based on biology. At age 18, the person becomes an adult. Again, at that age in the US, you can vote, join the military. Again, it's, 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 it's a social and legislative construct, but it's not based on brain science. Across the US, depending on what state you're in, you can use tobacco legally from ages 18 to 21. Again, this is not based on science. It's just based on things we do and laws we make. And you can use alcohol legally by the time you're 21. 
But if we go back to the science and the brain science, and we think about the, how, we, how we kind of formulate things socially and behaviorally versus biologically, they don't always match. And that's all that I'm trying to point out. This next slide is just something for fun um, that I like to point out that even in the US, we, we can't agree these states, this is driving ages in the US. And I told you on, on average, most states consider 16 to be the age where youth can drive or get a driver's license. So those are represented by the blue states here. However, there's some states in the yellow portion where you could be 15, the green state is 14, the red state over here, which is New Jersey, is actually 17. So in the US, we can't even agree on what, and this, these are legislative by states, right? These are legislative decisions, not based on brain science. So in, in the US as well, if you ever try to rent a car, you have to be at least age 25. And if you ever try to get uh, car insurance, the rates are higher for adolescents because those companies know that adolescents in terms of driving are a bad bet meaning they're more likely to uh, engage in accidents and so forth, okay? All right, so, so kind of moving on. So what, how does that help us? So it helps us because it helps us kind of think about what information do adolescents need? So this, this graph is based on uh, studies that, that a, research, a group of researchers did looking at adolescents and how they make decisions and how they make risky decisions. So again, across the x-axis here is age, so as adolescents get older, and then across the y-axis is what's called standardized tendencies. And what's the, what this particular means just in general is that the higher you get, the worse decisions you're making. So generally, we want to see these lines getting lower across time. Okay, so it turns out that for this black line here, when adoles adolescents are, are given a risky decision, but they have some idea or the consequences of those risky decisions are known, they are actually less likely to make them across time as they get older, okay? It also turns out that with looking at the blue line is when adolescents are faced with risky decisions, and even the consequences of making those are ambiguous or they're not quite clear. They tend to peak around age 16 to 20, if you see the top part of the line here, and then tend to drop off. In part, we think because of experience. There also tends to be a third group of adolescents, which is actually a smaller subset of adolescents. So probably the adolescents more at the yellow part of the triangle, which I presented earlier, which are, we call insensitive. So when, the, when they're uh, presented with a risky decision, they, it really doesn't matter if they know the consequences or not, because they're gonna follow kind of their own decision-making process. And usually in most cases, it's not the one that's gonna produce the best outcome. And this tends, and these folks tend to peak earlier around age 12 to 16. So there tends to be a smaller set of, of adolescents or a smaller group or subset of adolescents, which tend to make risky decisions earlier that we can actually find earlier in the population. And, and these are tend to be, at least in the US kids, who are having problems in school or making worse decisions earlier on. It tends to be that most adolescents are gonna, either gonna fall on, the, on the, uh, the black line or the blue line. Okay, so what does that mean for us? So what it really means, and the big message here is that when adolescents know or have an understanding of the consequences of the decisions they're trying to make, across time, they make better decisions. So let me put that another way. When adolescents have better information about the decisions they're trying to make, they make better decisions. One of the examples I use in the US all the time is most adolescents I work with spending, spend much more time researching their next cell phone purchase than they do researching their next, the next substance they're gonna put in their body. And the substance they're gonna put in their body can have a, large, a, a bigger outcome in a negative way than their next cell phone purchase, okay. So what does this mean for substances and so forth? Well, one of the things we, we when we go back to looking at uh, drugs that, that are used and substances that are used, we go back to looking at the brain. And this is called the reward pathway of the brain. And again, we're gonna go back to the, remember I told you the top, the bottom part and middle and top part of the brain? Well, this is the middle part of the brain. This is the limbic area of the brain. And it turns out when, when folks use substances, this middle part of the brain gets activated. So here's the idea, here's heroin here, here's, here's nicotine, heroin, cocaine, and alcohol. Regardless of the particular substance used, they all interact with reward pathway in similar ways. It could either be more directly through these two, through these two areas here, and I'm not gonna name them because it's not that important for this lecture, 
um, or more indirectly. But what happens here and what the dots are representing, remember I said the neurochemicals interact with each other and communicate with the neurons. What happens when someone takes a particular substance is it increases the level of a, a particular neurotransmitter. In this case, it's called dopamine. It increases the level of dopamine in the reward pathway. And it says, I like it, I like it, keep doing that, which is also connected to the prefrontal cortex. So the theory is that even though the middle part of the brain is saying, I like it, keep doing it, the front part of the brain doesn't quite have the brakes in which to say, stop doing that. That might not, might not be a good idea. We also find that when we engage in, in typical behaviors, like when we eat food, when we have sex, or when we have nurturing, this middle part of the brain and the top part of the brain also get activated. So when we engage in those three things, like typically typical things, again, eating food, having sex, getting nurtured, those the, the, the dopamine also kicks in in this reward pathway. Unfortunately, what happens when we take various substances, it kicks in the dopamine and exaggerates it above and beyond what would it would be for typical experiences like eating, for example, eating food, having sex, or getting nurtured. Okay, so let's look at that a little more closely. When we take this example here, and here's the brain right here, these three parts. So one of them is called the nucleus accumbens, ventral tegmental area, and the prefrontal cortex. It's kind of this similar slide I showed you before. So here's the example. When we have food, it increases the dopamine in that reward pathway. And it says to our body, that's good. We're having food. We're, we're getting our appetite met. And then it shuts off. And then it says, you're done. And you can stop eating. When we do things like take cocaine, it exaggerates that do those dopamine levels and it floods that channel or that prefrontal, or the, I'm sorry, that reward pathway with dopamine above and beyond what it would be. And one of the things it's doing is, is we think theoretically is it's resetting those dopamine levels in that reward pathway. So the brain is then saying, I want more of this. I want more of this. So when we think about someone who uses substances over a period of time, they develop what we call tolerance or they need more of the substance to get the same effect. One of the reasons we think that we think that occurs is because the level of dopamine is increasing in the brain and the brain is telling itself, I want more of this. It also turns out on the flip side is that when people stop using a particular substance, right, like cocaine or another substance, or smoking is a good example of this, it decreases the level of dopamine in the brain. Well, it turns out the brain doesn't like that. And it says, I want that dopamine back. And so when we stop using a substance, our body experiences what we call withdrawals. In particular, what's going on there is it's a biological indication that your brain is saying, I want more of that dopamine. And withdrawals typically are so unpleasant that people find themselves using the substance again in order to avoid the withdrawals. That's one of the reasons why we think quitting smoking is so difficult. Okay. <clears throat> So here's some of the key takeaways that, that I, I, I want to I I kind of wrap this thing up with and thinking about both of the social, the behavioral, and then the biological aspects of this brain. So when we talk about the middle part of the brain, right, we know that some of the things we should expect during adolescence include things like risk-taking and impulsivity, in parts because some of those sub structures that I talked about in the brain are related to those, especially the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area. It's not that important that you know that, but what's more important is you know that we, we expect biologically during typical adolescent development that they're gonna engage more risk-taking. And that's good, we actually want them to because that's how they learn different behaviors, right? That's how they learn things between things that they should engage in or not engage in, but we want them to do that in a way that makes sense with the knowledge about what some of those consequences are. We also know that it's correlated with impulsivity. We also know that adolescents don't always make the best decisions. And it's part of the reason we think that is because the prefrontal cortex isn't yet fully developed. So that's coming online, right? As they're dealing with the middle part of the brain that is coming online during adolescence. So we expect this risk-taking and, and, and impulsivity to occur. Where it, can, where it can go wrong, though, is when they engage in things that can ha have long-term outcomes, like using particular substances and so forth, because we know that it actually changes some of the brain chemistry. What, that's just what I've talked about before. Now, the third part is the top part of the brain, or what I call cognitive control. We also know that we want to develop more cognitive control, and there's no reason that we need to wait until adolescents are 25. And I would not suggest doing that anyway. 
As interventionists, we know that we can teach adolescents skill sets and so forth to enhance that top part of the brain through learning, because we know that the brain responds to the environment, like I said before. So what are some of the things we want, we want to focus on in terms of doing that? Well, well here's some of the take home concepts. One of them is prevention is important. The early we try to prevent things from occurring in the, in the first place, the better. And er, it's never kind of too early to do that. In my, my field, we talk about substance use and we, I either want to prevent kids from getting to the yellow part of the triangle, I want to keep them in the green part of the triangle, or if they're in the yellow part of the triangle, I want to help them get back down. So that means either preventing the problem from occurring in the first place, so keeping them in the green part of the triangle, or preventing the problem from getting worse, I want to get, I want to keep them in the yellow part and then move them down to the green. I don't want them to get to the very tip top, which I consider the red part of the triangle, which is when they're going to need treatment and so forth. We can do a lot more if we actually try to prevent some of these things. The other things we know about based on some of the concepts uh, around brain development and social and behavioral aspects that I just talk, talked about is we can teach. The, none of these things are mysteries. We can teach adolescents about changes in the brain and the body in terms of growth periods and effects on the brain and the body. When I've worked with adolescents and done focus groups, I've asked them, what are the things you wanna know about substances? And, and most commonly they tell me the things that we wanna know is what are substances and what do they do? How do they affect your brain and body? Remember what I told you before, one of the most uh, potent protective factors is when adolescents perceive that a substance is gonna be risky to them, they're less likely to use them. So I want adolescents to make good decisions about what they're putting into their body. Some of the other things that I would inform adolescents about and talk to them about is teaching emotional regulation. And, and that's a fancy way to say, how do you deal with emotions during adolescence, knowing that the middle part of the brain is coming online and that's gonna be one thing that's expected. How do you deal with emotions when the top part of your brain isn't quite developed yet? So we all know when we experience anger or things like depression, we don't make our best decisions. The reason we do that, there's a biological reason we do that, is because like what I said, the front part of your brain slows down. The front part of your brain also slows down when we take particular substances. So when an adolescent is under the influence of a particular substance, they're not gonna make great decisions. So one of the examples that I use is like is anger management. And one of the strategies that we've talked about for long periods of time is, is counting to 10 when you become anger, when you become angry. And when I work with adolescents, many times they laugh at me for saying that. But I but after I've done the brain development piece, I approach it a different way. And I said, instead of thinking, instead of thinking about counting to 10, what you're actually doing is giving yourself an opportunity and giving your brain an opportunity to reset the chemicals. Okay. And sometimes when I say it that way, it makes a lot more sense to them. They're like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Because if you give yourself 10 seconds or 20 seconds to reset the chemicals, you're going to be thinking more clearly about what you want to do. The other thing is teaching problem solving and decision making. There's no reason why we can't teach those things that are going to enhance the front part of your brain in terms of how to make better decisions, how to problem solve. And in the US, we don't do this explicitly in schools, unfortunately. Um, we, we teach problem solving uh, in, implicitly. So an example that I use is a lot of times in the US, we teach adolescents how to problem solve, in al for, for example, in, in algebra, how to solve for x. But my, my argument is, how do we teach adolescents how to solve for X when someone offers them a substance or a drug at a party? Does that generalize? And most times we don't do a good enough job of teaching adolescents those generalizable skills of how do they problem solve? How do they respond to peer pressure in the moment? And then the last thing kind of goes along with that is teaching the influence of contextual pressure, peer pressure, social media, advertising, we know that the brain interacts with the environment. We know that adolescents are influenced by all the things they see, especially social media. We have plenty of studies now to say that social media is not, doesn't have the greatest outcomes for adolescents, especially with adolescents who are at risk for other problem behaviors and so forth. So these are things we wanna teach adolescents about and so on. Okay, um, one of the things I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you with is a, this, I'm not gonna be able to show the whole thing, but this is just a quick video that we developed. Um, and um, and I, I will, I'll send you the link to this too. This is, this is in uh, uh, English, I realize, 
But what we did is we created these videos. So basically 80% of what I just said is on this video. So you could, you could show it to an adolescent, you could show it to someone you work with and so forth to get the, get, get the basic concepts about adolescent brain development. And this is, see if I can get it to work here. This brief video on the effects of substances on the teen brain is presented by the Mountain Plains. So this is a minute, Technology 55 seconds. Center, funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. The brain is a complex organ. Let's consider it from three different parts. The cortex area, which is the top part of the brain, is responsible for how we think and how we make decisions. The middle part of the brain, or the limbic area, is responsible for things like emotions and memories. And the bottom part of the brain, or what we call the brain stem, is responsible for keeping the brain and body functioning. So one important question to ask is what happens to these parts of the brain when an adolescent uses substances? In particular, we're going to focus on the middle part of the brain or the limbic area and the top of the brain. So, so you get the concept, but that's basically most of the things I told you about the brain in about two minutes. And we did that so people can put this on their social media posts or show it to adolescents and explain these concepts and so forth. So that's basically the, what I have for my talk. Um, the reason I'm able to do this uh, talk is because the center we have. And so we have a quick survey that'll take you about 30 seconds. You can actually put your phone up to this QR code and just, and we have actually this translated in Spanish. If you don't mind doing this survey for us, um, we'd be really appreciative. It just helps us know how we're doing on the presentations that we provide and, and what the feedback is, like what we could do better. But, but I think we have a little bit of time and I'm happy to, to, to hang out and, and answer any questions you have. Sí, efectivamente, si alguno de los participantes de la conferencia desea hacer alguna consulta, la puede realizar mediante un chat o también puede solicitar eh, para poder proporcionarle el micrófono. Hay un comentario eh, en chat, nos dice Lali Palomis, súper interesante. Si consideramos como una sustancia nociva la visualización permanente de programas violentos en juegos o programas televisivos, esto producirá las mismas alteraciones nocivas que la cocaína y otra droga en el cerebro de un adolescente. Esa es la pregunta. Uh, Jason. Yes. Uh, should I translate the question? Yeah, yeah please do. I got, I got okay. most of it, but just I want to make sure I'm getting it correct. Okay, if we consider, uh, say, that substance seen permanently, uh, violent programs and video games, uh, does this produce the same uh, bad alterations than cocaine or other drugs in the brain of a teenager? So it. it, it, it... Yeah, so that's that's a it's a great question, right? So what produces alterations in the brain? And the reality is we don't know that yet. So we don't even know like how much it takes. Like if you drink for that, for example, I use the, the example of alcohol. We don't know if drinking, you know, a, a can of alcohol, let's say every night, will produce differences versus drinking once a week. Uh, we don't have that data yet. So what I will say is that anything that produces trauma to the brain in the sense is, is that it heightens that middle part of the brain, that amygdala part of the brain, and it's chronic. It happens over a long period of time. We think, there, we think from a theory perspective that that will produce alterations in the brain. And, and basically what happens is it won't allow those prefrontal cortex connections to be made as the adolescent gets older. So basically what we're saying is an adolescent who doesn't experience that trauma versus an adolescent who does, they'll be in, in a different space because an adolescent who doesn't experience that trauma will have a better opportunity to make those connections for the top part of the brain. And what we want is for typical adolescent de development is for everyone to have an equitable chance to let the brain develop as it needs to. So, so that's kind of... So I'm hoping I'm answering the question, but that's kind of one of the main cruxes of, of what of the last 25 years of neuroscience, because we used to think that the brain was fully developed at age five. Now we know it's not. So now we know we need to take care of the brain while it's still in this adolescent stage. 
Okay, thanks, uh, Jason. Uh, we have we have another comment. Sure. Uh, this comment has like five questions in one. <laughs> it's uh, the first question is: Has cyber addiction displaced substance addiction, or are they two mutually exclusive phenomena? Yeah, they're they're not mutually exclusive. So so th there's a lot of other kind of quote addictions out there. I mean. You know, you can argue whether they fulfill the, the criteria like medically or behaviorally, you know, because I teach an addictions course for graduate students. And so one of the, you know, I hear addictions like shopping addiction, chocolate addiction, cyber addiction, pornography addiction, you know, you, you name it. So they, they could actually be where, where they really become an addiction is when they disrupt the course of your life. And you're not able to have the same capacity to fulfill obligations that you normally would if the if the if the um, addiction didn't exist, and so that's kind of the criteria I use. They're not mutually exclusive, though. Some people who have quote one addiction may have you know other things that they gravitate so, uh, towards as well. But one thing I want to caution against: there used to be this concept of an addictive personality. I think from the literature in, in my time teaching, we know that that's pretty much been disbunked. We don't think there's quote an addictive personality. We we think there's there's people that gravitate more towards doing various things over time. But we think the reason that is is because biologically, what's going on in the brain is you're increasing the neurotransmitters, the dopamine channel, and the brain saying, "I want to do this more." And you don't have the capacity to say the front part of your brain say you probably shouldn't do this because it's it's really affecting your life in various ways. And we also know from the example of drugs or substances that it's changing the neurochemical balance. And that's we we also think so. It's a it's a behavior and a biological thing. And that's one of the reasons we think it's so hard to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you probably answered some of the other questions okay. that were okay, in yeah. that comment. <laughs> It says, uh, is there an increase in comor comorbidity of cyber addiction and substance addiction? Not necessarily. Do both, yeah. Yeah. Do both addictions overlap, reinforce, and enhance each other? They, they could. They could. G generally, when you find uh, someone has issues or problems in one area, they typically, they're not mutually exclusive, right? So even when I talked about the risk and protective factors for substances, because they have uh, uh, issues or problems in one area, doesn't mean they're not going to have problems in another area. And, and most times we find that there is, but it, but it doesn't always mean we, we don't necessarily know what they're going to have problems in. So, so usually with addictions, we find that there's a lot of comor comorbidity with like depression and anxiety. Um, and sometimes people usually use the substances to kind of treat the depression and or anxiety themselves. Okay. And his last question was, has the prevalence of substance addiction decreased and the cyber addiction increased? Not, ne not necessarily. Um, there really isn't, we, at least from my, my knowledge, we don't have great, we don't have great, we have much better data on substance addiction and prevalence rates. We have far less data on quote, these other addictions like cyber addiction and so forth. I think we'll have better data in the, in the next five to 10 years because we're starting to take notice of them, but we've been doing substance use work for like, you know, 20, 50 years or 40 to 50 years. So we just have much more data on it. Because if you think, if you think about, you know, when the internet got developed, I mean, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's fairly recent compared to when we think about substances. Um, there's another question. Uh, I, I think you talked about this at the end of your uh, presentation. In your experience, what activities or skills would uh, strengthen our teenagers? Absolutely. So, so here we go. So I'm going to go back to these slides. I talk about these in terms of principles, right? So I, I always get asked the question, is there any programs I should use or whatever? And I don't really care what program you use. I, I, I think whatever program you use should cover these principles because these are principles based in what we know about the biologic biologic nature of the brain and also the, the behavioral development. So one is earlier is better, right? The earlier we can do things is better. Teaching kids about the changes in the brain and body, that's not a mystery. We should teach these things. They're gonna experience it other way. And remember what I said, the more information you have, the better decisions you make. 
teaching about emotional regulation. We know that adolescence and puberty in particular is a key time for emotional regulation. We wanna teach kids how to, how to regulate emotion like anger and mood and so forth. Teaching about problem solving. We wanna strengthen that prefrontal cortex. How do, how do we problem solve things? How do we just make decisions about things? How do we weigh consequences between one thing and another? And the other thing from the environmental piece is teaching influence and contextual pressure, right? So I know in the US, there's the, the drug manufacturers, cigarettes, alcohol, they're great at marketing, unfortunately, right? They're great at marketing. And we wanna teach adolescents, what are those messages? And what are those messages they're getting? And so forth. And how do they, how do they combat those? You know, um, social media is another way. And then uh, peer pressure is another way. So, so I would say those are kind of the five things that I would say from a principle-based perspective that I would say we, we definitely want to capture with adolescents, regardless of what program you're using. Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, I don't know if, if maybe you could uh, finish uh, telling us about, I, I, maybe you did that at, at the start, but uh, many people have connected afterwards. Uh, where do you work? Uh, what sure, sort sure. of? Yeah. Yeah. So I work at the, uh, the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, my I don't know if my my email is right here. You can always feel free to email me if you have additional questions. I always offer that. Um, feel free to email me. You know, ask me questions um, and so forth. And also, if you, I'll go back to this earlier slide. We have a website, so feel free to take advantage of our website here. Here's our. Um, it, um, our, H, our HTTP address and so forth. But uh, either way, you know, um, I'm happy to chat and, and ask questions. I know it may be a little different in the US than versus Peru, but, but I'm happy to do whatever, whatever I can and, and give you the knowledge that I have at least um, about what we know about particular substances and so forth. And, and, and just, so I'm, I'm a professor, I've been a professor for 20 years and I'm a, I'm a psychologist by training and, and I've worked with adolescents for pretty much the majority of my career. Um, last question, in, in what sort of context, like in uh, psychological consultations or schools? All of the above. I've done school-based work. Uh, so, so like at the prevention, so in the, in the US, when we work in schools, we kind of consider that prevention just because of the way that it's perceived. When we work in, out in the community, we do treatment, right? So I've done clinical studies. Um, if you can't sleep at night, I'll send you my studies and they'll put you right to sleep. So they'll bore you to death. I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, yeah, I've done treatment studies. I've done prevention work. I've done uh, uh, work consultation with our juvenile justice system. Um, so adolescents across the spectrum, from those who we want to prevent from getting into problems, to those who are already in problems and how do we prevent them from getting worse? So kind of across the board. Okay, um, Paul wants to say some words. Hey, Paul. Uh, <laughs> I, I, we have to unmute him. Uh, I have to tell the person that can do this. So we have to wait a minute. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Juan. Um, so, hello, Jason. Hey, Paul. Uh, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> uh, so, I want to I want to say Jason uh, was also involved in the Young Parenthood program uh, and the studies that we did in Salt Lake City um, that I presented on a couple of days ago. Um, and uh, and I do actually have a question for Jason and the, the team. Um, one is one of the things that is, I mean, I think the questions about cyber addiction are really interesting because, you know, it's new. And yeah. I think the population is still trying to figure out what to do with the internet and with our phones. And it'll be really interesting to see how that develops over the years. Um, we, we invented alcohol uh, before we invented the wheel. Um, <laughs> just as a civilization. Uh, and so we, we've been dealing with that problem for a very, very long time. Um, but the question that I have, it has to do with vaping um, yeah. and e cigarettes. And I don't know if that's a phenomenon in Peru, um, but my sense is, is that it was 
I mean, that it, it's a serious problem in the United States, but I'm kind of getting the impression that it's, it's diminishing somewhat. And I'm, I don't know if there's any data uh, to indicate that. Or not, Jason? I don't know if you do that. There, there is, um, yeah. So, so both actually, interestingly enough, Paul, because I did a workshop with the Monitoring the Future, who does the national data last summer, and then I use our Utah data, which kind of mimics that. And and there has been some drop offs, but the but the problem we don't we don't know yet if that's due to kind of underreporting due the fact that these surveys were done during the COVID years. Um, so we're going to have to wait probably one or two more years to see if that upticks again as well. Because what happened was, and, and the other thing is in the U.S., we didn't even start recording uh, e-cigarette data until like 2015. And some surveys still don't record it, believe it or not. Um, we saw a huge uptick and which surpassed combustible cigarettes by and far. Um, and then we've seen some drop, uh, but we've seen actually drop in other substances as well. So it's hard to tell right now whether that's due to just these pandemic years or it's due to actually something else is going on. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if you're able to translate all of that, uh, Juan, but um, if uh, I'm curious as to what, what you're seeing in- Yeah, in, that, that's a great question though. With the e-cigarettes e and vaping. Um, yeah, no, the, the translation is, has been done already, but <laughs> are, you ask, are you asking about Peru or? Yeah, about Peru. Oh, um, I, 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 don't, I don't know if it's as big as in the U.S. because I don't know the U.S. context, but uh, uh -huh. yeah, you, you see, I think there's a little, you see some shops, you see teenagers, well, not, I don't know if teenagers, but young people doing it. Probably a bigger trend in the US, I would think. Yeah, maybe, maybe so. Yeah, it became uh, very, very big and very, very much a, a public health concern. Absolutely. Yeah, and I have a whole nother lecture I do on e cigs. And, and the fact is, we just don't know a lot about it in terms of the chemical, you know, I could go into the chemicals and, and uh, what's in them. You know, and it's 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 a really it's an interesting phenomenon. I'll be honest with you. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Jason. It was good to of see. Course. You. Of course, of <laughs> course. Thanks for inviting me. Yes. Uh, so there are no more questions. Uh, thank you very much, Jason, for the lovely lecture. Good. Uh, you have been very kind for accepting our invitation. And yeah. It's, it's Bye. A, see you next. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I hope it was useful. Yes, see you next time. Okay, bye bye. Muchísimas gracias al doctor Jason Barrow eh, por el importantísimo tema prevención del abuso de sustancias en adolescentes, conectando el cerebro y el comportamiento. Antes eh, de finalizar, es importante resaltar que en sus 40 años, el Instituto Nacional de Salud Mental en este presente año 2022, viene preparando la primera encuesta nacional de salud mental a realizarse en el Perú, por lo que se viene realizando una serie de capacitaciones tanto a los profesionales de la institución como a los encuestadores, con la finalidad de desarrollar una entrevista integral y completamente estructurada de acuerdo con las definiciones y criterios para fines clínicos y de investigación. La sección de diagnóstico de la entrevista se basará en entrevista diagnóstica internacional compuesta por la Organización Mundial de la Salud. El trabajo de cada uno de los colaboradores de este proyecto sin duda colocará al instituto como integrante activo en la red científica nacional e internacional que es nuestra misión y compromiso institucional durante estos 40 años de creación. Seguidamente, tenemos palabras de clausura a cargo del doctor Juan Alberto Claus Matos, jefe de la Oficina de Cooperación Científica Internacional y presidente del Comité Central de Jornadas Institucionales por nuestro 40 aniversario. Adelante, doctor. Sí, quiero agradecer todavía 
Sí, justo estaban preguntando por la exposición de Militz Álvarez. Eh, lamentablemente este, nos dijo de que no iba a poder hacerla ni ella ni su equipo. Por eso eh, movimos la exposición del doctor Burro Sánchez para las seis de la tarde. Eh, bueno, lamentamos esa circunstancia, pero es bueno. A veces suceden estas cosas en las conferencias. Este, emergencias, ¿no? Emergencias que no se pueden este, evitar. Eh, bueno, sí, para cerrar esta, este ciclo virtual de las noches, eh, que ha sido enfocado en eh, programas e investigación en niños y adolescentes. Este, bueno, agradecer a todos los ponentes invitados que con mucha amabilidad han accedido eh, dar su tiempo y brindarnos eh, ponencias muy, ri, muy enriquecedoras y que estoy seguro que este, nos han ayudado mucho. ¿no? Este, a todos los que han ido ingresando también, muchas gracias por, por el interés, por estar acá con nosotros. Eh, esperemos que hayan disfrutado este ciclo virtual. De todas formas, este, mañana tenemos otro día más en el horario normal de 9 a 3. Eh, lo que tenemos mañana es eh, el tema central de las jornadas, que es un poco reflexionar sobre la visión y el rol y los desafíos que tiene el Instituto Nacional de Salud Mental. Eh, esta vez, eh, invitando a personajes que han cumplido una labor destacada en el pasado del instituto, ¿no? Vamos a tener al doctor Julio Guamán, eh, vamos a tener al doctor Perales, al doctor Nizama, al doctor eh, Luis Matos y al doctor Renato Alarcón. Eh, algunos de ellos en, eh, presenciales y otros eh, virtuales. Este, quiero recordarles que la, las, las jornadas institucionales han sido mixtas, y se les ha dado la oportunidad a los ponentes de elegir hacerlo eh, de forma presencial o de forma virtual. ¿no? Eh, bueno, también tenemos mañana la clausura, la ceremonia de aniversario. Eh, vamos a realizar un reconocimiento a los ex directores del instituto por su valiosa labor realizada en el pasado por la institución. Por favor, también quedan invitados a la clausura, que es a las once y media, y a la ceremonia de aniversario, que es a las doce. Eh, muchas gracias de nuevo, eh, y bueno, me, me despido por el día de hoy. Buenas noches.